Hello, it's me again. I'm back to read to you again. Today I'm just going to read a few short stories. So there'll be about four or five of them, but they're only a couple pages long. So hope there's some that you enjoy. And then I'm going to end up with a funny one. Okay, so this first one is called The Passerby by Hester Tatro. It says, I saw him most mornings when I looked out of the living room window. He became part of my day. Slightly bent, he dragged, he dragged one leg a little, the foot twisted, so that he walked more on the side of his foot than the sole. I guessed he was in his 80s. He wore only a flannel shirt. When I could see his breath against the air on a frosty morning, I wondered if he was cold. While working in the garden one morning, I saw the old man smile and tousle the head of a the hair of a small boy who passed by him on his way into school. It's now or never, I decided, emboldened across the street and introduced myself. His pale blue eyes enlivened and his face wrinkled in another smile. This time for me. My wife and I are from Switzerland. We came first to Canada and then to America many years ago, he told me. We work very hard. In time, we save enough to buy our own farm. I do not speak English so good, so I pick up children's first readers and secretly I study until I learn. He laughed. He gazed toward the elementary school beyond the wire fence and his face grew solemn. We never had any children. I pondered the conversation in the quiet of the day, touched deeply by the loneliness in his voice as he spoke of the few remaining relatives in his native homeland. <clears throat> distant not only by miles, but by lives lived worlds apart. My wife is not so good, he told me when I asked about her. I wanted to jump in, offer help, be a friend, but I had already pushed myself upon this stranger. Reserve ruled the moment. I pointed to my house. Please, I said, leaving the next overture to his discretion. Stop in and have a cup of coffee with me sometime when you're out walking. I didn't see him after that, but I thought about him often. Was he housebound or sick? Had his wife's health deteriorated suddenly? If only I knew his name or where he lived. My invitation mocked me with its ineptitude. I had so wanted to be a friend. Months went by before I saw him again. On an errand, and only 15 minutes walk from home, I saw the familiar limp and swing. He moved slowly, shoulders slumped, and one foot twisted so that the heel did not stay in its shoe. His pale face was thinner than I remembered, but his eyes still twinkled, and he smiled in recognition as I reintroduced myself. I learned his name was Paul. I don't walk as far as I used to, he explained. My wife, I cannot leave her very long. Her mind is going. He grimaced with a touch to his forehead. She forgets things. He gestured toward a green and white wood-framed house across the street and said, Would you like to come in and, and see my drawings? I'm on my way to pick up my car from the garage, I said regretfully, but I'd love to see them another time. You come this evening, then. He looked hopeful. Oh, yes, I said. I will come this evening. The pungent smell of damp fir needles permeated the chill, sulky evening air. Paul stood expectantly by the window. When he opened the door, he was groomed for company. His wife, slender and frail, came from the kitchen, tucking wisps of white hair back into a tidy bun. Come in, come in she bid with a smile full of the grace of her generation. She reached out a worn, soft hand. This, Paul said, is my wife, Bertha. He straightened and grew in stature. We have been married 56 years. That evening, I was introduced to Paul's pen and ink sketches. We went from room to room, pictures hung in modest frames, Pages were tucked in drawers. There were sketches of celebrities, scenes, anything that took his fancy. 
each had a story. But the compelling story was the harsh reality of talent ignored for people like him of that generation. It won't put bread on the table, his father told him. If you sit around drawing like that, you'll never amount to anything. His mother died when he was nine. He remembered the gentle tap of her stick against his head whenever she found him with pad and pencil in hand. Make yourself useful. Don't waste your time, she chided. When we returned to the kitchen, Bertha searched for some tangible expression of her hospitality. Uh, I wish I had cookies to offer you. I can't cook like I used to. I couldn't eat a thing. I just finished dinner, I said. Their dinner was meals on wheels, three days a week. We cannot eat so much. We have plenty for the next day, except Mondays. Mondays we try to cook for ourselves. They wanted me to stay a while. We sat and talked. Dignity filled their house. Paul answered the door the following Monday. His eyes fell on the tray I carried. He was glad I'd come. But his pinched and agitated face told me I'd stumbled upon an outburst of anger. Bertha, pale and flustered, gathered herself. We're not feeling so good today, and I'm having trouble with my head and remembering. She threw her hands up. I don't know what it is. Old age? They led me into the kitchen. Canned soup dripped where it spilled over the stove. Paul's hand shook as he showed me the hole scorched in his shirt sleeve as he tried to cope with the meal. The flare-up, cut short by my arrival, had taken its toll. He put his hand to his forehead and sighed, gaining equilibrium. It's just that she upsets me sometimes, he said, arranging the knives and forks on the table as I set out the lunch I had cooked. Bertha still fretted to know where she had put the wooden spoon he no longer needed, and my heart ached for her. Frailty of age, its irritability, frustrations, limitations, and fears had been too much for them both that morning. Impassioned by their need, I reached for Bertha's trembling hand. Could we sit down and pray, I asked. Oh, Bertha explained, that's what we need more of. Paul joined us in a chair beside the couch. After I prayed for them, I looked up. Gratitude and relief flooded their faces. All tension was gone. I hugged them both and delighted in the hugs I received in return. You're too good to us, Paul said, making his way to the dining room table and pulling out a chair for his wife. No, I thought. God's too good to me. He allowed me to share this moment as he touched two people he loves very much. How blessed I was in the process. I wanted to be their friend, and he had given me the desire of my heart. Okay, we'll go on to another one called Delayed Delivery by Kathy Miller. There had never been such a winter like this. Stella watched from the haven of her armchair as gusts of snow whipped themselves into a frenzy. She feared to stand close to the window, unreasonably afraid that somehow the blizzard might be able to reach her there, sucking her, breathless, out into the chaos. The houses across the street were all but obliterated by the fury of wind-borne flakes. Absently, the elderly woman straightened the slipcovers on the arms of her chair, her eyes glued to the spectacle beyond the glass. Dragging her gaze away from the window, she forced herself up out of her chair and waited a moment for balance to reassert itself. Straightening her back against the pain that threatened to keep her stooped, she set out determinedly for the kitchen. In the doorway to the next room, she paused, her mind blank, wondering what purpose had propelled her there. From the vent above the, above the stove, the scream of the wind threatened to funnel the afternoon storm directly down into the tiny house. Stella focused brown eyes on the, move, on the stovetop clock. The 3.15 time reminded her that she had headed there and take something out of the freezer for her supper. Another lonely meal that she didn't feel like preparing, much less eating. 
Suddenly, she grabbed the handle of the refrigerator and leaned her forehead against the cold, white surface of the door as a wave of self-pity threatened to drown her. It was too much to bear, losing her beloved Dave this summer. How was she to endure the pain, the daily nothingness? She felt the familiar ache in her throat and squeezed her eyes tightly shut to hold the tears at bay. Stella drew herself upright and shook her head in silent chastisement. She reiterated her litany of thanks. She had her health, her tiny home, an income that would suffice for the remainder of her days. She had her books, her television programs, her needlework. There were the pleasures of her garden in the spring and summer, walks through the wilderness park at the end of the street, and the winter birds that brighten the feeders outside her kitchen picture window. Not today, though, she thought ruefully as the blizzard hurled, it, hurled itself against the eastern wall of the kitchen. Ah, Dave, I miss you so. I never minded storms when you were here. The sound of her own voice echoed hollow, hollowly in the room. She turned on the radio that stood on the counter next to a neatly descending row of wooden canisters. A sudden joyful chorus of Christmas music filled the room, but it only served, served to deepen her loneliness. Stella had been prepared for her husband's death. Since the doctor's pronouncement of terminal cancer, they both faced the inevitable, striving to make the most of their remaining time together. Dave's financial affairs had always been in order. There were no new burdens in her widowed state, it was just the awful aloneness, the lack of purpose to her days. They had been a childless couple. It had been their choice. Their lives had been so full and rich. They had been content with busy careers and with each other. They had many friends, had. That was the operative word these days. It was bad enough losing the one person you loved with all your heart. But over the past few years, she and Dave repeatedly had to cope with the depth the deaths of their friends and relations. They were all of an age, an age when human bodies begin giving up, dying. Face it, they were old. And now on, on the first Christmas without Dave, Stella would be on her own. Mabel and Jim had invited her to spend the holiday with them in Florida, but somehow that had seemed worse than staying at home alone. Not only would she miss her husband, but she'd miss the snow and the winter and the familiarity of her own home. With shaky fingers, she lowered the volume of the radio so that the music became a muted background. She glanced toward the fridge briefly, then decided that a hot bowl of soup would be more comforting fare this evening. To her surprise, she saw that the mail had come. She hadn't even heard the, the creak of the levered mail slot in the front door. Poor mailman out in this weather. Neither hail nor sleep. With the inevitable wince of pain, she bent to retrieve the damp white envelopes from the floor. Moving into the living room, she sat on the piano bench to open them. They were mostly Christmas cards, and her sad eyes smiled at the familiarity of the traditional scenes and at the loving messages inside. Carefully, her arthritic fingers <laughs> arranged them among the others clustered on the piano top. In her entire house, they were the only seasonal decoration. The holiday was less than a week away, but she just didn't have the heart to put up a silly tree or even set up the stable that David built with his own hands. Suddenly engulfed by the loneliness of it all, Stella buried her lined face in her hands, lowered her elbows to the piano keys in a harsh abrasive of discord, and let the tears come. How would she possibly get through Christmas and the winter beyond it? She longed to climb into bed and bury herself in a cocoon of blankets, not emerging until her friends in spring returned. The ring of the doorbell echoed the high-pitched, discordant piano notes and was so unexpected that Stella had to stifle a small scream of surprise. Now, who could possibly be calling on her on a day like today? Wiping her eyes, she noticed for the first time how dark the room had become. The doorbell sounded a second time. Using the piano for leverage, she raised herself upright and headed for the front hall, 
switching on the living room light as she passed. She opened the wooden door and stared through the screened window of the storm door with consternation. On her front porch, buffeted by waves of wind and snow, stood a strange young man whose hatless head was barely visible above the large carton in his arms. She peered beyond him to the driveway, but there was nothing about the small car to give clue to his identity. Returning her gaze to him, she saw that his hands were bare and his eyebrows had lifted an expression of hopeful appeal that was fast disappearing behind the frost forming on the glass. Summoning courage, the elderly lady opened the door slightly and he stepped sideways to speak into the space. Mrs. Thornhope? She nodded confirmation, her extended arm beginning to tremble with cold and the strain of holding the door against the wind. He continued predictably, I have a package for you. Curiosity drove warning thought from her mind. She pushed the door far enough to enable the stranger to shoulder it and stepped back into the foyer to make room for him. He entered, bringing with him the frozen breath of the storm. Smiling, he placed his burden carefully on the floor and stood to retrieve an envelope that protruded from his pocket. As he handed it to her, a sound came from the box. Stella actually jumped. The man laughed in apology and bent to straighten up the cardboard flaps holding them open in an invitation for her to peek inside. She advanced cautiously, then turned her gaze downward. <gasps> it was a dog! To be more exact, a golden Labrador Retriever puppy! As the gentleman lifted its squirming body up into his arms, he exclaimed, This is for you, ma'am. He's six weeks old and completely housebroken. The young pup wiggled in happiness at being released from captivity and thrust ecstatic wet kisses in the direction of his benefactor's face. We were supposed to deliver him on Christmas Eve, he continued with some difficulty as he strove to rescue his chin from the wet little tongue, but the staff at the kennels start their holidays tomorrow. Hope you don't mind an early present. Shock had stolen her ability to think clearly. Unable to form coherent sentences, she stammered, but I don't, I mean, who? The young fella set the animal down on the doormat between them and then reached out a finger to tap the envelope she was still holding. There's a letter in there that explains everything, pretty much. The dog was bought last July while her mother was still pregnant. It was meant to be a Christmas gift. If you wait just a minute, there are some things in the car I'll get for you. Before she could protest, he was gone, returning a moment later with a huge box of dog food, a leash, and a book entitled Caring for Your Labrador Retriever. All this time, the puppy had sat quietly at her feet, panting happily as his brown eyes watched her. Unbelievably, the stranger was turning to go. Desperation forced the words from her lips. But who, who bought it? Pausing in the open doorway, his words almost snatched away by the wind that tasseled his hair. He replied, your husband, ma'am. And then he was gone. It was all in the letter. Forgetting the puppy entirely at the sight of this familiar handwriting, Stella had walked like a somnibulist. To her chair by the window. Unaware that the little dog had followed her, she forced her tear-filled eyes to read her husband's word. He had written it three weeks before his death and had left it with the kennel owners to be delivered along with the puppy as his last Christmas gift to her. It was full of love and encouragement and admonitions to be strong. He vowed that he was waiting for the day when she would join him, and he had sent her this young animal to keep her company until then. Remembering the little creature for the first time, she was surprised to find him quietly looking up at her. 
his small, panting mouth resembling a comic smile. Stella put the pages aside and reached for the, bo for the bundle of golden fur. She had thought that he'd be heavier, but he was only the size and weight of a soft pillow. And so soft and warm. She cradled him in her arms, and he licked her jawbone, then cuddled into the hollow of her neck. The tears began anew at this exchange of affection, and the dog endured her crying without moving. Finally, Stella lowered him to her lap, where she regarded him solemnly. She wiped vaguely at her wet cheeks, then somehow mustered a smile. Well, little guy, I guess it's you and me. His pink tongue panted in agreement. Stella's smile strengthened, and her gaze shifted sideways to the window. Dusk had fallen, and the storm seemed to have spent the worst of its fury. Through fluffy flakes that were now drifting down to a gentler pace, she saw the cheery Christmas lights that had edged the roof lines of her neighbors' homes. The strains of joy to the world came in from the kitchen. Suddenly, Stella felt the most amazing sensation of peace and benediction washing over her. It was like being enfolded in a loving embrace. Her heart beat painfully, but it was with joy and wonder, not, not grief or loneliness. She need never feel alone again. Returning her attention to the doll, she spoke to him. You know, fella, I have a box in the basement that I think you'd like. There's a tree in it and some decorations and lights that will impress you like crazy. And I think I can find that old stable down there too. What do you say we go hunt it up? The puppy barked happily in agreement, as if he understood every word. Okay, let's move on to our next one. This one is is called A Gift from the Heart by Norman Vincent Peale. You might have heard of him before. It said, New York City, where I live, is impressive of any stein, at any time, but as Christmas approach, it approaches, it's overwhelming. It seems like we're having lots of Christmas stories. Store windows blaze with light and color, furs and jewels, golden angels 40 feet tall, hover over Fifth Avenue. Wealth, power, opulence, nothing in the world can match this fabulous display. Through the gleaming canyons, people hurry to find last-minute gifts. Money seems to be no problem. If there's a problem, it's that the recipients so often have everything they need or want that it's hard to find anything suitable, anything that will really say, I love you. Last December, as Christ's birthday drew near, a stranger was faced with just that problem. She had come from Switzerland to live in an American home and perfect her English. In return, she was willing to act as secretary, mind the grandchildren, do anything that was asked. She was just a girl in her late teens. Her name was Ursula. One of the tasks her employers gave Ursula was keeping track of Christmas presents as they arrived. There were many, and all would require acknowledgement. Ursula kept a faithful record, but with a growing concern. She was grateful to her American friends. She wanted to show her gratitude by giving them a Christmas present. But nothing that she could buy with her small allowance could compare with the gifts she was recording daily. Besides, even without these gifts, it seemed that her employers already had everything. At night from her window, Ursula could see the snowy expanse of Central Park and beyond it the jagged skyline of the city. For below, in the restless streets, taxis hooted and traffic lights winked red and green. It was so different from the silent majesty of the Alps that at times she had to blink back tears of the homesickness. She was careful never to show. It was in the solitude of her little room a few days before Christmas that a secret idea came to Ursula. It was almost as if a voice spoke clearly inside her head. It's true, said the voice. 
that many people in this city have much more than you do, but surely there are many who have far less. If you will think about this, you may find a solution to what's troubling you. Ursula thought long and hard. Finally, on her day off, which was Christmas Eve, she went to a great department store. She moved slowly along the crowded aisles, selecting and rejecting things in her mind. At last, she bought something and had it wrapped in gaily colored paper. She went out into the gray twilight and looked helplessly around. Finally, she went up to a doorman, resplendent in blue and gold. Excuse me, please, she said in her hesitant English. Can you tell me where to find a poor street? A poor street, miss, said the puzzled man. Yes, a very poor street, the poorest in the city. The doorman looked doubtful. Well, you might try Harlem or down in the village or the Lower East Side, maybe. But these names meant nothing to Ursula. She thanked the doorman and walked along, threading her way through the stream of shoppers until she came to a tall policeman. Please, she said, can you direct me to a very poor street in Harlem? The policeman looked at her sharply and shook his head. Harlem's no place for you, miss. And he blew his whistle and sent the traffic swirling past. Holding her package carefully, Ursula walked on, head bowed against the sharp wind. If a street looked poorer than the one she was on, she took it. But none seemed like the slums she had heard about. Once she stopped a woman. Please, where do the very poor people live? But the woman gave her a hard stare and hurried on. Darkness came sifting from the sky. Ursula was cold and discouraged and afraid of becoming lost. She came to an intersection and stood forlornly on the corner. What she was trying to do suddenly seemed foolish, impulsive, absurd. Then, through the traffic's roar, she heard the cheerful tinkle of a bell. On the corner opposite, a Salvation Army man was making his holiday traditional Christmas appeal. At once, Ursula felt better. The Salvation Army was a part of life in Switzerland, too. Surely this man could tell her what she wanted to know. She waited for the light, then crossed over to him. Can you help me? I'm looking for a baby. I have here a little present for the poorest baby I can find. And she held up the package with the green ribbon and the gaily colored paper. Dressed in gloves and overcoat a size too big for him, he seemed a very ordinary man. But behind his steel-rimmed glasses, his eyes were kind. He looked at Ursula and stopped ringing his bell. What sort of present, he asked. A little dress for a small, poor baby. Do you know of one? Oh, yes, he said. Of more than one, I'm afraid. Well, is it far away? Could I take a taxi, maybe? The Salvation Army man wrinkled his forehead. Finally, he said, It's almost six o'clock. My relief will show up then. If you want to wait and you can afford a dollar taxi ride, I'll take you to a family in my own neighborhood who needs just about everything. And they have a small baby? A very small baby. Well then, said Ursula joyfully, I wait. The substitute bell ringer came. A cruising taxi slowed. In its welcome warmth, she told her new friend about herself. How she came to be in New York, what she was trying to do. He listened in silence, and the taxi driver listened too. When they reached their destination, the driver said, Take your time, miss. I'll wait for you. On the sidewalk, Ursula stared up at the forbidding tenement, dark, decaying, saturated with hopelessness. A gust of wind, iron cold, stirred the refuse in the street and rattling the reeling ash cans. They live on the third floor, the Salvation Army said. Shall we go up? But Ursula shook her head. They would try to thank me, and this is not for me. She pressed the package into his hand. Take it up for me, please. Say it's from, from someone who has everything. 
The taxi bore her swiftly from the dark streets to lighted ones, from misery to abundance. She tried to visualize the Salvation Army man climbing the stairs, the knock, the explanation, the package being open, the dress on the baby. It was hard to do. Arriving at the apartment on Fifth Avenue where she lived, she fumbled in her purse, but the driver flicked the flag up. No charge, miss. No charge? echoed Ursula, bewildered. Don't worry, the driver said. I've been paid. He smiled at her and drove away. Ursula was up early the next day. She set the table with special care. By the time she was finished, the family was awake and there was all the excitement and laughter of Christmas morning. Soon, the living room was a sea of gay, discarded wrappings. Ursula thanked everyone for the presents she received. Finally, when there was a lull, she began to explain hesitantly why there seemed to be none from her. She told about going to the department store. She told about the Salvation Army man. She told about the taxi driver. When she was finished, there was a long silence. No one seemed to trust himself to speak. So, you see, said Ursula, I try to do kindness in your name. And this is my Christmas present to you. How do I know all this? I know it because ours was the home where Ursula lived. Ours was the Christmas she shared. We were like many Americans, so richly blessed that the, to this child, there seemed to be nothing she could add to all the material things we had. And so she offered something of far greater value, a gift from the heart, an act of kindness carried out in our name. Strange, isn't it? A shy Swiss girl, alone in a great impersonal city. You would think that nothing she could do would affect anyone. And yet, by trying to give away love, she brought the true spirit of Christmas into our lives, the spirit of selfless giving. That was Ursula's secret, and she shared it with us all. Okay, another short story. What if I get tired of being in heaven? And this is by Larry Libby. It's real short, but just think about heaven in this way. If you're thinking you might get bored or tired after being in heaven for a while, don't worry. Try to imagine something with me. Imagine you're a little bird who lives in a tiny cage made of rusty metal. And inside your cage, you have a food dish and a little mirror and a tiny perch to swing on. Then one day, some kind person takes your cage to a big, beautiful forest. The forest is splashed with sunlight. Proud, towering trees cover the hills and valleys as far as you can see. There are gushing waterfalls and bushes drooping with purple berries and fruit trees and carpets of wild flowers and a wild, wide blue sky to fly in. And besides all these things, there are millions of other little birds hopping from one green limb to another, eating their fill and raising their little families and singing their hearts out all through the day. Now, little bird, can you imagine wanting to stay in your cage? Can you imagine saying, oh, please don't let me go. I'll miss my cage. I'll miss my little food dish with seeds in it. I'll miss my plastic mirror and my tiny little perch. I might get bored in that big forest. <laughs> that would be silly, wouldn't it? And it's just as silly to think we might run out of things to do in heaven. Okay, one just short little tiny kind of a joke. It'll, it'll give you a laugh. I've, I've told it to some of you ladies before. but Just a couple paragraphs here. See if you uh, get a laugh out of this one. The little white lie that cried. It said, Alice was to bake a cake for the church ladies group bake sale, but she forgot to do it until the last minute. She quickly baked an angel food cake, but when she took it from the oven, the center had dropped flat. She said, oh dear, there's no time to bake another cake. So she looked around the house for something to build up the center of the cake. 
Alice found it in the bathroom, a roll of toilet paper. She plunked it in and covered it with icing. The finished product looked beautiful, so she rushed it to the church. Before she left the house, Alice had given her daughter some money and specific instructions to be at the bake sale the minute it opened and to buy that cake and bring it home. When the daughter arrived at the sale, she found that the attractive cake had already been sold. Oh, Alice was beside herself. The next day, Alice was invited to a friend's home where a fancy lunch was served and to top it off, the cake in question was presented for dessert. Alice saw the cake. She started to get out of her chair to rush into the kitchen to tell her hostess all about it. But before she could get to her feet, one of the other ladies said, what a beautiful cake. Alice sat back in her chair when she heard, heard the hostess, who was a prominent church member say, thank you, I baked it myself. All right, hope you enjoyed those stories. We'll see you soon.